Egypt that you've been seeing during the second anniversary of the Tahrir Square uprising are just the latest and most vivid illustration that Egypt's revolution is going off the rails. It has revived talk about the failure of the Arab Spring and even some nostalgia for the old order. But let's remember that old order was doomed. Arab dictators like Hosni Mubarak could not have held on to power without even greater troubles. Look at Syria. But events in the Middle East the past two years do underscore something I've long believed, that constitutions should take precedence over elections. Let me explain. Look at the difference between Egypt and Jordan. At the start of the Arab Spring, it appeared that Egypt had responded to the will of the people, made a clean break with its tyrannical past, and was ushering in a new birth of freedom. Jordan, by contrast, had a number of protests, but King Abdullah responded with only a few personnel changes and promised to study the situation and talked of reform. But then Egypt started going down the wrong path and Jordan made a set of wise choices. Put simply, Egypt chose democratization before liberalization. Elections became the most important element of the new order, used in legitimizing the new government, electing a president and ratifying the constitution. As a result, the best organized force in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, swept into power and was able to dominate the drafting of the Constitution. The document has many defects. It failed to explicitly protect women's rights. It allowed for media censorship in the name of national security. And in November, Morsi declared that his decrees were above judicial review. In Jordan, by contrast, the king did not rush to hold elections and was widely criticized for his deliberate pace. Instead, as he explained on this program last week, he appointed a council to propose changes to the constitution. In September 2011, the council transferred some of the king's powers to parliament and established an independent commission to administer elections. Those elections held just 10 days ago were boycotted by Jordan's Muslim Brotherhood on the grounds that the changes were too small and that power still resided with the king. But 70% of eligible voters registered and 56% turned out at the polls, the highest turnout in the region. Many critics of the king and government were elected. 12% of the winners were opposition Islamist candidates. Thanks to a quota that the commission had set, 12% of the new parliament's members are women. King Abdullah II retains ultimate authority, but the new system is clearly a step in a transition to a constitutional monarchy. Morocco has taken a similar route as Jordan, enacting constitutional reforms in 2011 as well. On the other hand, the Arab world's two largest experiments in democracy, Iraq and Egypt, have unfortunately made poor choices in common. Both placed elections ahead of constitutions, popular participation ahead of individual rights. Both have had as their first elected leaders strongmen with Islamist backgrounds who have no real dedication to liberal democracy. The results have been the establishment of illiberal democracy in Iraq and the danger of a similar system in Egypt. The best role models for the region might well be two small monarchies, though of course much more reform is needed in both places. But basically, Jordan and Morocco have chosen evolution over revolution. So far, it seems the better course.